Okay, today we start a new mimer. This is again a Sukkot mimer, but uh, it encompasses a lot of the festivals of Tishrei, the entire Aveda, the month of Tishrei. It was said, Motsu Shabbos Parshas Hazinu, which was Yud Gimel Tishrei, the 13th of Tishrei, which is the Hilul of the Yorzai to Admar Marash, which will say it's the Yorzai of the Reb Marash, the fourth Reb of Chabad. He passed around on Yud Gimel Tishrei, which is two days before Sukkot. Early Erev Yitzchak Sukkot, the Tavshid Lamates. So that's the night before Erev Sukkot. This was when this this man was said. Um, so in other words, the Shabbos was Yud Gimel Tishrei, the the uh, yard site of the Reb Marash. This man was said Motzi Shabbos after Shabbos. Um, so it's just before Erosokos in the year Tovshin Lama Tess, 1978. So the Maimur goes, or starts with the Pasuk, the verse that describes the four species that are taken on Sukkos. It says in the Torah that you should take for yourselves on the first day, and it lists the four species which we call the Lul of Esrog, Hadassim and Ravas, that you should take for Sukkot. But the way it's described is, you should take it on the first day. First day of what? First day. The Beast of the Medrash, the Medrash asks, Is it the first day that you take it? The first, the first day of Aloy Tezlov Yomhu. It's on the 15th of the month of Tishrei. It's not the first. So why is the Torah saying you should take on the first day? The Medrash answers, it's the first day of the calculation of sins. One second. In, in the calendar, it's the 15th of Tishrei. That's when the first day of Sukkot is. So, it should have said, you should take on the 15th day of the month of Tishrei. But it says, you should take on the first day. What's the first day? So, Merges explains why it's not talking about the date, it's talking about the first day in calculating sins. What does that mean? On Yom Kippur, Hashem wipes out everything. All of our sins are wiped out on Yom Kippur, they're forgiven. He overlooks everything. And then after Yom Kippur, when you've, you've got a clean slate, Theoretically, you could start sinning again after Yom Kippur. However, from Yom Kippur till Sukkot, everyone's busy. And what are you busy with? With mitzvahs. It's only four days and short days, and you're busy with doing mitzvahs. One person is building a sukkah, the other guy's getting his lulav together. You're busy with mitzvahs during those four days. You don't have time to get back to the old ways of sinning. So then from the first day of Sukkot, Hashem says to the Jewish people, what was, was. We've, we've put that in the past. And from now on, we're making a new calculation. You've got a clean slate, and so now, now things are new. So Sukkot is really the time when the cheshpen of onus, the calculation of, of whether we're going to sin or not, starts again for the new year. Because we've just been cleansed on Yom Kippur. We had a few days of being too busy with mitzvahs to do anything else. On the first day of Sukkot, it's already, okay, now let's see what happens. And Rabba. Isn't that? That's the delivery of the judgment of the, of the, the, the of Rosh Hashanah, yeah. But as far as sin's concerned, your sins are cleansed on Yom Kippur. You're busy for four days. So when can you start sinning for the new year? When can you start having a new cheshbon, a new calculation, a new account? It opens on Sukkot. So therefore, it's called Rishon. Beyond Arishan, it's the first day of the new account of the year. Seems like also, also the last chance you have to kind of overcome your sins. Well, it cleans the Yom Kippur. Your sins are cleansed on Yom Kippur. It's all, it's all, it's all, you got a new, a new slate. So, Umezem Uvan. From this it means, the mitzvah natilas dalid minim betesvav tishrei, hu mitnei shu rishin 
It, this means that the reason why we have the mitzvah of the Dalad Minim, the four species, on the 15th of Tishrei, on that particular day, the reason why we take the Lulav on the, on the day of Sukkot, first day of Sukkot, is because it's the day that the new account begins of sins. Right? Because the Pasuk says, You should take on the first day these four species. Now we ask, what's the first day? We explained it's the first day of your new account. Okay, but what's the verse talking about? It's telling us to take the four species on this day. Which must mean that the four species somehow are connected to this new account that you've opened. Why? why? What's, what's, what's the particular connection between the four species and this new account of, uh, of the year? Why, why is that exactly there? So we have to understand, what is the idea that we're opening a new account, spiritual account in, in the year? And on that day, you have to take the four species. What's, what's the connection between the two? Continues. This is further needing to be explained based on what it says in the Medrash. There's a Medrash that says the following. Both the Jewish people and all the non-Jewish nations come before Hashem to be judged on Rosh Hashanah. And we don't know who won the court case. But when the Jewish people come out from before Hashem, holding their lulavs and their esrogim, they've got lulavim and esrogim in their hands, then we know that we are the winners, that we came out victorious in the judgment. And that's why Moshe warns the Jewish people and tells them that you have to take the four species on the first day of Sukkot. Okay. What's this measure saying? That there's a court case. And it seems this is a court case between two sides, between the Jewish people and the nations of the world on Rosh Hashanah. And we don't know who won, who came out victorious from this court case until the Jewish people appear with the lulav and the estrog in their hands and we know, ah, oh, they're the winners. Seems this was in ancient times a, a sign of a victory in court. You'd come out with your spear held up high, you know, like in, in, as a sign of victory. You know, I guess two people also today when come out of court, you know, lift their arms in the air uh, in victory. So the lulav is like that, is like a, like a spear of victory. And by holding this, the, the lulav and the estrog, the four species on, on Sukkot, we're expressing the fact that we have come out victorious in the court case that happened on Rosh Hashanah. So this medrash itself needs to be explained. Uh, so what, what's this court case between us and the, and the non-Jewish nations? That's what Rosh Hashanah is? Isn't Rosh Hashanah each person being judged on their own, themselves? It's not a, it's not a dispute being solved on, on Rosh Hashanah. It's a a judgment of each person in their future. But this measure seems to be saying that it's the Jewish people versus the nations of the world, and we come out victorious in that judgment, and we express that through the lulav that we brandish in our hands, we raise to, into the air victoriously on Sukkot. Anyway, that's what this medrash says, which we'll need to explain what it means. But <coughs> one thing we gain from this medrash is, Hainu de mitzvahs until his dalad minim b'chag ha-sukkot ba'ba hemshech ladin de Rosh Hashanah that this medrash makes it clear that the taking of the lulav on Sukkot is a continuation of the judgment of Rosh Hashanah. We were judged on Rosh Hashanah, we don't know who came out victorious. On Sukkot, we come out with the lulav to say we were victorious. So what is Sukkot? It's an extension of Rosh Hashanah, the judgment of Rosh Hashanah. So then, our question is even stronger. Why does it say you should take the lulav on the first day why does it say that you should take the lulav on this day? Why? Not because this is the 15th day from Rosh Hashanah. This is the conclusion, the extension, the continuation of Rosh Hashanah. But on the contrary, this is Rishon. It's the first day of a new calculation. It seems contradictory. The Torah says that you should take the lulav on this day because this is the first day which one medrash tells us means the first day of the new calculation of the new year. Like it's starting something new. 
But another medrash says that the reason we're taking the lulav is, uh, is expressing our victory in the court case that happened on Rosh Hashanah. Meaning that, that Sukkot, the lulav on Sukkot, is an extension of the Rosh Hashanah. So then it shouldn't say Rishon. It's, it's the first of the new thing. It should say the 15th day from Rosh Hashanah, and now we've expressed our victory. So these two medrashim seem to contradict what, what, what are the four species? Are they an expression of the new calculation? What's gone is gone, and we're now starting something new, which itself needs to be explained how. Or is it an expression of victory on Rosh Hashanah? Because we had this court case, which itself also needs to be explained what this court case was. So to understand this, the Rebbe points out that this statement about the four species that it should be taken on the Yom Rishon, the first day, is specifically talking about the four species. There's another mitzvah that we do on sukkahs, and that is sitting in the sukkah. And in relation to that, the sukkah is not described as on the first day. It doesn't say on the first day you should sit in the sukkah. It, it says on the 15th of the, of the month of Tishrei you should sit in the sukkah. So, for some reason, the lulav is connected to Rishon, this beginning thing, whereas the sukkah is the 15th. And so, here we have one yontif with two mitzvahs, and they're described differently. So, to understand what it means that lulav is on the first day, this, this new calculation of the year, we have to understand the difference between the lulav and the sukkah. So that's in base. The Yuvan Zebahetim Behachilak Shaben Sukkah Ladalud Minim. This will be understood by first understanding the difference, the spiritual difference between the Sukkah and the four species of the Lulav. Because they actually have a common denominator. Both Lulav and Sukkah indicate the idea of oneness, unity, which we learned in the previous Mimer as well. And we'll explain that later more in depth. So they both have, have the same theme to it, and that's unity. <laughs> Nevertheless, there is a difference between the two expressions of unity, the unity expressed by the sukkah and the unity expressed by the lulav. What is that? The unity of the sukkah is essential unity. Meaning, that essential unity means a unity that was never apart, a oneness that is one that was never divided. There is a simple oneness. It's not a conglomeration <coughs> of parts. It's a oneness that is indivisible, never was separate. <laughs> That's why it says in the Gemara that the entire Jewish people could sit in one sukkah. It would be appropriate, it would be fitting for the entire Jewish people to sit in one massive sukkah. What does that mean? Because a sukkah is something that is above division. When a bunch of people are sitting in the sukkah, so who's the most in the sukkah? If you have a group of people in the, in the, in the sukkah, who's more in the sukkah? Who's the, who's the most in the sukkah? No one. There's no, there's no more or less in the sukkah. There's no, there's no division. You can't say, well, I'm in the sukkah a bit more than you. If you're in, you're in. You're in it, you're a part of it. There's no more or less. It's, it's, it's a totally unifying factor. You're in the sukkah, I'm in the sukkah equally. We're in the same sukkah. Not, neither of us can say we're connected to the sukkah more than, than each other. Not, no one has a, has a greater claim on the sukkah. You're all in it. If you're in it, you're in it. So the idea that the entire Jewish people in one sukkah means that really the entire Jewish people have a, a unity, an achtos, a oneness that is beyond division, that can't be divided up. It's not, it's not that you're in the sukkah separately or differently or uniquely. Everyone's in the sukkah in their own way. No, you're all in the sukkah the same way. And... Somebody who is very intelligent and understands the depth of what the sukkah is, or somebody who is less educated or less intelligent or less aware and doesn't really know what they're doing in the sukkah, that's a difference in your mind. But as far as your being in the sukkah, you're in the sukkah equally. You're exactly the same. If, you, if you've been in the sukkah many times or it's the first time you've ever been in the sukkah, it's still the same sukkah, the same being in the sukkah. It's, it's a unifying factor that everyone's equal. So that's a oneness that is beyond any division. And that's called achdos be'etzem, an essential unity. 
It's not a unity that there's something in common. It's just, it's just there's, there's no division whatsoever. You're all in the sukkah equally. That's what sukkah represents, that level of, of unity. But the mitzvah of the four species, the lulav, who is a different unity. It's the unity that is created from disunity, from multiplicity taking disparate parts, separate entities, and uniting them and bringing them together as one. You've got four species, each one unique and different, but you make them good achas into one united entity. That's different. The sukkah is unity where you're really one. There's, 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 not, there's nothing dividing you. You're all in the sukkah as one. There's no, no divisions. The, the, the four species are four different species being brought together as one. Multiplicity Plurality being made into a unit, a, un, a unit, a oneness. Meaning that even though the four species are four di- different separate species, and they are in fact from one extreme to another. This is the medrash to dalid minim shabalulav hem kenegad dalid sugim shvi yisrael. As the famous medrash says that the four species of the lulav correspond to four categories of Jewish people. Masug she kenegad esrog. And this spans from the category of the esrog, which the esrog has a flavor and it also has a scent, which represents Torah and Maisim Tovim, that the esrog represents a Jew that has Torah wisdom and also has good deeds, has both fruit and a scent. All the way down to the category that is, is represented by the arava, the willow branch, that has no flavor, and it has no scent, which represents somebody who, the Rebbe doesn't explain that one, that, uh, that somebody who doesn't have either, either Torah or good deeds. But in the Lulav, the four species become one united thing. There's still a clear esrig and a clear willow. They're different. They're, they're two different species. Not like in the sukkah. In the sukkah, we're all the same. You're in the sukkah, the same. Whether you're learned or not learned, it makes no difference. In the four species, there are four distinct species. There's no merging of the, of the four. They're not, they're, not, they're not all the same. They're different. But they're brought together as one. So you've got there a unity, but it's a unity, unity that's made out of multiplicity. Many becoming together as one. Whereas the sukkah is a unity where the many is, is, not, is not really relevant. It's not, it's, the issue is not that there's many. The issue is that we're one. We're united under the sukkah. Yeah, you, see, you get the difference? Okay. So there's, there's achtos pe'etzem, essential unity, where there's just one thing. Or then there's achtos that comes from ribui, unity that comes from multiplicity coming together as one. They're the two unities of these two mitzvahs, the sukkah and the four species. The gamla pirush. Then there's another interpretation of the four species. We just mentioned the one that's, that is better known, that the four species ca- correspond to four categories of Jews. There's another interpretation of the four species in another medrash that says that the four species hint on Hashem. Each one of them is a, is a representation of, of Hashem. And, you know, the four, like the four letters of Hashem's name are the four species. Okay, the fact that something from above, Hashem, is hinted at in the four species down here, it must mean that it's talking about four levels, four different madregas in Hashem. So, in other words, even when we're talking about Hashem, Hashem is one. Hashem is certainly a oneness. But, but within Hashem, there are madregas, there are levels of His emanation, of how He expresses Himself. If we're talking about four species representing Hashem, well, if you're using the number four to represent Hashem, obviously you're talking about four different layers, th- different levels of Hashem. Just like Yudke Vavke is four different layers and levels of Hashem. So there also, it's not talking about unity that is a oneness, it's talking about it, many aspects being one. <clears throat> that all the layers of Hashem, all the ways, that modes of Hashem's expression being one. As it says in the brackets, Now there's a principle that says all different interpretations on one verse are connected. When you have one pasuk, one verse, but you have many different interpretations, and they're totally different, but they're all connected. If they're on one verse, on the same verse, they must all have a, a common thread. 
So yesh loy mesh achiluk bedalim adregis de lemayla v'mrozim bedalim minim who mina katsa lekatsa. So it must mean that the four species representing the four madregas in Hashem must also be from one extreme to another. But dugmas achiluk she ben dalit sugim and al disrol, just like the four species representing the four levels of Jewish people. Uh, from one extreme to another, the esrog all the way to the, to the arava, the person who has Torah and good deeds to all the way to the person who has neither. So to the four layers of Hashem's light that are hinted at in the four species must also be from one extreme to another. They're, they're totally different. And nevertheless, by the mitzvahs until you dalad minim, she called dalad minim hem mitzvah achas hem achtim. That the mitzvah of taking the four species together, which that is what the mitzvah is, that's one mitzvah, it's not four mitzvahs, it's one mitzvah, taking all four together, it unites these four layers of Hashem's light. So, so whether, whether we take the medrash that says that the four species represent four categories of Jews, or the other medrash that says the four species represent Hashem, but it's four layers of Hashem's light, the idea of the mitzvah is taking four separate entities and bringing unity to them, as opposed to sukkah, which is that it's not relevant if it's four or a hundred or a thousand. Sukkah is a uni- unifying thing that unites us in an in a, in a essential way. So that's the difference between sukkah and lulav. So one is taking unity where there was no separate, separateness in the first place. In the sukkah, there's no division. Then there's a layer of unity that is a lower layer of unity. And that is unity where there is many, where there are separate entities, but you brought them together. Now that in the Gimel, the Rebbe is going to show that there's a, actually a third mitzvah of Sukkot, which represents a third layer of unity, even further down. What's that? Look at Gimel. Bin ela achre mitzvah yeshiva Sukkah, the Sukkah mitzvah dal in the fils dal in minim, bo ha mitzvah da krobas kabanus achad. After doing the mitzvah, sitting in the Sukkah, and the mitzvah of taking the four species. There's another mitzvah of Sukkot, and that is the mitzvah of bringing the sacrifices of the festival, the daily sacrifices of the, of the, the particular ones for the festival. Right? The mitzvah of Sukkah is the first mitzvah of Sukkot, because from the first moment that the Yontav enters, you have a mitzvah to sit in the Sukkah. Then the mitzvah of taking the four species will be the next mitzvah, because that starts straight away in the morning, for, on the first morning of Sukkot. But then after that, there's the Karbanas, the Musafim, the various additional sacrifices for the festival of Sukkot. And that, that will come later, starting from the first day and every day of Sukkot, but after you've taken the Lulav. Now, with the sacrifices, She'ikorim hem ha'ayin parim, the main sacrifices for Sukkot are the 70 bulls. That over the course of the, the festival of Sukkot, every day there was a, a number of bulls brought, Altogether, 70 bulls over the seven days of Sukkot. Increasing numbers. Though. Yeah. And that's Kivin Shapar Shor who are Melech Shabbat And that's because the par, the ox, or the bull, is the king of, of animals. Of, of the domesticated animals, the, the ox is considered the king. In the wild animals, maybe the, the lion is the king. But in domesticated animals, uh, the ox is the is the king, and so bringing that is the is the central most important uh, sacrifice of Sukkot. And these seventy bulls that are brought over the course of Sukkot, keneged shivim umos, correspond to the seventy nations of the world. The Book of Bereshis, after the flood, the families that extended from Noach and his and his children, uh, counted in, as the nations of the world, and there are 70, 70 nations. And they, they say that even even till today, when nations, there are more, more countries than 70, but as far as nationalities, ethnic groups, there still are, are, there are 70 categories, which are the 70 nations. So the 70 sacrifices, the 70 bulls that were brought over Sukkot, corresponded to the 70 nations of the world. What does that mean? What, what are we saying? What does it imply that the 70 bulls brought on Sukkot correspond to the 70 nations. Well, what does that mean? Dalidei hakravas ayin parim through the bringing these 70 bulls valderach zev achshav valderach miras psukei hakarbonis ayin parim and these days when we don't have a, sa- have a temple through saying the verses of the 70 bulls that were sacrificed unashal nukfarim sfaseinu that our lips take the place of the bulls 
And so therefore, by reading in the Torah the sacrifices and reading in the Musaf prayer on Sukkot the sacrifices, we reenact on a spiritual level what happened. So these 70 bulls that were brought, or the 70 bulls that we read about today, Nasabir Homus, that achieves an elevation and a purification of the nations of the world. Meaning, the idea of the 70 bulls corresponding to the 70 nations was that by the Jewish people bringing a sacrifice in the temple on behalf of each nation, that would lift the spiritual status of that nation to a higher place. It would elevate them. It would be to their benefit. In fact, one of the sages said that if the nations would know the benefit they got from the sacrifices, they would have put guards around the temple to make sure nobody ever destroyed it. If they would realize what, what, what benefit they would have. So, so the idea is that by bringing a sacrifice that corresponded to that nation, it would, it would elevate the spiritual status. It would refine that nation. It would bring them to a higher place. So we could say, Why is it specifically that we bring a sacrifice to elevate the 70 nations on the same day as we, as we shake the Luluf? Why is it particularly Sukkot that we're doing this? Because we said earlier that brandishing our Luluf in the air is the expression of our victory in the judgment that happened on Rosh Hashanah. And what did we say the judgment was between the Jewish people and the nations of the world? What does it mean that we've really won that court case? That we said that through the Jewish people waving their, their lulav, it means they've won the court case. But what have they won? Real victory means that even the nations of the world agree with our victory. So through bringing the 70 bulls, which correspond to the 70 nations, the nations of the world are elevated and refined to the point that they agree that the Jewish people have won. What does this mean? It seems that this idea that the court case on Rosh Hashanah is between the Jewish people and the nations of the world, what does it mean? It means that the Jewish people represent the divine presence in this world. That's, that's the Jewish mission. And the nations of the world represent this world. They, they are part of this world. Our, mes- our mission is a heavenly mission. That, that we, we are uh, uh, Hashem's people. We represent God in the world. The nations of the world represent humanity. That's, that's normal human beings. The Jewish people are the ones that are not normal. The, the nations of the world are normal human nations. Whereas the Jewish people are this nation that represent Hashem in the world. The court case is between these two parties, between the Jewish people and the nations. Who who is going to determine world policy? Who is going to determine the direction of the world? Is it going to be the nations of the world which are just a part of this world? Or is it going to be the Jewish people who represent Hashem? What is going to be victorious? That's, that's That's what's in the balance on Rosh Hashanah. The Jewish people winning the court case means that the divine purpose of the world is going to be enacted, it's going to be fulfilled. Hashem's presence is going to be felt in the world. And so we win the court case, not the, not the nations of the world. But to really win that court case, it has to be not just that we celebrate the victory and the, and the nations of the world are disappointed. It has to be, to really win it means that the nations of the world are happy with that. That's, that's exactly what they want too. Because you can't say you've won the court case if the nations are not happy. Why? What have you won? If the idea is that Hashem is going to be revealed in the world, so who should, who should Hashem be revealed to? Who should feel Hashem's presence? The, the world should feel it, including the nations of the world. So if the Jewish people win the court case and the nations of the world are upset about that, don't want that to happen, we haven't really won. When have we truly won the court case? When the nations of the world are themselves happy that, yes, the Jewish people need to bring God into the world and we need to support them. We need, we need, we need to recognize that and be a part of that. The victory is only true when the nations also celebrate that victory. Especially. Mm -hmm. Because we are are already saying that. Right, exactly. So it doesn't gain anything for us to to be celebrating. The whole point is that the nations of the world should be agreeing with it. So what this this is saying on a a more global level, that 
that the Jewish mission is to bring Hashem into the world. And the indication that that has been successful is when the nations of the world recognize our role and appreciate it and support us and are open, open to, to what we're doing. So while for much of history the Jewish people have not been a voice, have, have, have been ostracized and uh, persecuted and left out of the conversation of nations, okay, that, that means we haven't won yet. We haven't really, Hashem's purpose has not been fulfilled. It's only when the nations of the world want to hear the Jewish opinion, want to hear the Jewish voice and, and, and uh, respect it. That's when we've actually started to fulfill what we're supposed to be doing. So, so the fact that on the festival of Sukkot, we wave our lulav, indicating that we have won the court case, that Hashem's light is going to shine in the world, and uh, then the Jewish people will be the, the bearers of that message. And also on that Yontav, we bring 70 bulls, which correspond to the 70 nations. It's to refine the nations. Our, our mission is to refine the nations of the world, that they should also be, uh, be respectful and open to the message. And that is the true indication that we've won, that, that we've won the court case. So, third last line. That's also the connection between saying halal for all seven days of sukkahs and the sacrifices of the, of the 70 oxen, the 70 bulls. What, what do you mean? The fact that we say complete halal for the entire festival of sukkahs, which we don't do on Pesach. On Pesach we say complete halal the first two days, but the rest of the Yontav we don't. Whereas on Sukkot we say complete halal for the entire seven days. Why is it different? It's because Sukkot is different to Pesach. On Pesach, every day the same sacrifices were brought. On Sukkot, there's a different set of sacrifices every day, a unique set of sacrifices. And so because there's a new sacrifice brought every day, there's a new expression of halal, of praise to Hashem. Whereas on Pesach, because it's not new, the first day is, 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 is the first day really, there's, there's a... There's a a new sacrifice, Pesach, but then the rest of the time there's just the same Musaf every day. Whereas Sukkot is new every day, so therefore there's a new halal, there's a new praise of Hashem every day. So why indeed is one dependent on the other? Why is halal said every day because the sacrifices are different every day? Why, what's the connection between the two? <speaking in Hebrew> through the elevation and refinement of the nations of the world that is achieved through bringing the 70 bulls, what is achieved is what we say in the halal, and that is that all nations should praise Hashem. That that all the peoples of the world should sing His praises. But why should they praise Hashem? Because His kindness has uh, been expressed. For us. Who's us? The Jewish people. That the nations of the world praise Hashem because His kindness was expressed to us. So in other words, what's the, what's the, center, the central line of Halal? The central line of Halal is this, is this line. Halal Hashem Kal Goyim. That all the nations will praise Hashem. Why? Because his, great, his goodness was bestowed upon the Jewish people. That when the nations of the world recognize that their fulfillment comes through the Jewish people fulfilling our mission, when Hashem's light shines through us, that will bring fulfillment to the entire world. So then they praise Hashem. Thank you, Hashem, for sending the Jewish people and for, for bringing your light into the world. That, that's when we've really done, done our job. So, so on the, the very same day that we shake the lulav, showing that we've won the, the victory, that's the day we start bringing the sacrifices for all 70 nations that they should recognize that we haven't beaten them in a downtrodden way, that we've, that we've conquered them and therefore they're, they're lost. No, our victory is their victory. If the Jewish people are victorious, if we're fulfilling our mission, so then that's good for the entire world. When the world realizes that, so that's, that's when its mission is, is being fulfilled.
So, just to summarize what we got till now, that there's three mitzvahs now in Sukkot. And in fact, all three mitzvahs express the same thing on three different levels. They're all mitzvahs about unity. There's the, the unity of the sukkah, which is the Jewish people should all be in one sukkah. It's, it's total unity. There's no difference, no differentiation. That's unity be'etzim. Then there's the unity of the, of the four species, which are the four categories of the Jewish people. Specifically the Jewish people, but four categories. And they all become one. Then there's the 70 bulls, which represent the 70 nations of the world. And even they are part of the unity. Even they join into the unity because they recognize the, the Jewish people's uh, contribution of bringing meaning and connection to Hashem to the entire world. So they praise Hashem because Hashem was good to us. That's unity of the entire world. And we'll see why the Dalit Minim, the, the four species, is called, it's brought on the day that's called Rishon, the first day, the, the day of the first of the new calculation of the year. Whereas the sukkah is on the 15th of the month. We'll see why when the moment continues. Mr. Shepard.